one of the things that's really driving the mandatory overtime policies right now is the fact that there is a labor shortage. There continues to be a labor shortage, even though the um, more robust unemployment benefits that were subsidized by the federal government have expired. What do you think is behind that? Well, it's it's clear that you know, the, the, the whole story about the generous unemployment benefits, there was a lot of research on that. I mean, I'm not going to say it had zero, zero effect, but the idea that that was somehow keeping millions of people from working, that, that just didn't make any sense. And we knew that. So now that they've ended, and of course, they ended for everyone uh, a couple of weeks ago, but they ended in most states, um, many in June, others in July. So it's not new that they've lost those benefits. But what seems to be the case, and you know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I don't think anyone's got a total explanation for this. I think workers are in a position to be more choosy about where they go to work. And my guess here, and again, this is a guess, is that if you manage to, to stay employed through the downturn, or at least most of the downturn, the pandemic, um, you got those pandemic checks, which were a total of uh, 3200 for a person, you know, 2000 uh, and then 1200 earlier, um, additional money if you had kids. Um, people who were getting unemployment benefits, in many cases, they did get more than what they got working. So if you go back to the original CARES Act, people got $600 supplements in addition to their unemployment benefits. We had people that were working 25 hours a week at $250 a week. They were at, 200, uh, at $10 an hour. They were getting much less than what they're getting in benefits. There were a lot of people, I think, that actually improved their financial shape through the pandemic. And I don't just mean, you know, Jeff Bezos obviously made a lot of money on Amazon, but I think a lot of uh, more moderate income people were able to, to improve their financial situation and they can now be more choosy about their jobs. So when you look at the lowest paid jobs, things like restaurant work, retail work, you're seeing rapid increases. And I think that's because people feel they don't have to take those jobs and they aren't going to take them unless they do get pay increases. So that's a good story. The part you're talking about where they say, oh, OK, well, we can't get workers. So what we're going to do is tell everyone they have to work more hours. Well, that's a real downside. That's a real bad story, obviously. Um, some workers will just leave. And that's good if they're in a situation to do that and find another job, as many are. But that, I think, is a story that we're seeing right now. Employers are trying to adjust to a different environment. I hope my, my analysis there is correct. Again, I may not be. But if, if it's really the situation workers can be more choosy about where they go to work. To my view, that's a great story. And, you know, again, employers aren't going to be happy. Some will go out of business. You know, that's one of the things um, they always find a restaurant owner who goes, I can't afford to, to pay 15 bucks an hour. And some restaurants can't. That's capitalism. They, that's, that's, uh, that's why we don't still have half our workforce working on farms. They weren't profitable when workers could get jobs in factories that paid them more money. So we're in, uh, interesting might be not the best term here, but interesting times where we may see workers in a position to get real gains. And we'll probably get a better story on that, better picture in the next three or four months as, you know, hopefully the pandemic uh, recedes again. I think there's evidence we are getting it under control. Even states like Florida, the numbers are way down. So I think I'm being optimistic, but I think we'll get it more under control. And we'll see what the labor force looks like. But for right now, um, you are seeing big wage gains for the lowest paid workers. And I have to say, that's a really nice thing to see. Uh, I believe they call it uh, creative destruction it. in the free market world. Um, yeah. And you, you mentioned that it's interesting times. And it's uh, it was interesting to me that during his press conference this morning, President Joe Biden claimed that he is, quote, tired of trickle down economics. Um, you know, on the one hand, he's proposed some pretty robust legislation that uh, I, you know, certainly unlike anything that's come about in, in, a, in, a, in a long time. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, politically, he seems to be having some trouble getting um, some of his more conservative Democrats on board with his agenda. What, what do you make of the whole of the whole uh, fight over this new big reconciliation bill? There, there are a lot of good things in that bill. So it's, of course, upsetting to see that you have more moderate conservative Democrats resisting, not altogether surprising though. So, you know, how do you bring in the Senate, uh, Sinema and Manchin on board? Uh, you have, I don't know what the final number is, eight, nine, 10 uh, conservative members in the house who are saying it's too big. Um, I'm assuming at the end of the day, I mean, there's one thing I'll say, uh, Pelosi is masterful at corralling uh, her members. I think she will get votes. It won't probably won't be for what you or I would like 
think it'll be the three and a half trillion. And we should be careful about that. I've been haranguing people. It's about 350 billion a year. It's not that large. It's about 1.2% of the economy. And it's still less than half of the military budget. So we aren't talking about some monstrous sum. Most of it's paid for with new taxes. But anyhow, so they'll probably get less than that, but I think they could still get enough to make a really big difference. I, I didn't say anything about climate change here. This is perhaps the most fundamental, not that they all aren't very important, but we know time is running out. So it's really important that we make a big down payment on trying to reorient our economy to, to clean energy, electric cars, uh, more conservation. We have to do it. We should have done that two decades ago, three decades ago, probably. But you know, we have to do it now if we want to have a livable planet 20, 30, 40 years out. Well, you know, to your point about how this isn't some monstrous bill, uh, it's certainly being uh, reported on that way. It's being talked about that way by corporate Democrats in the Senate. And uh, all of a sudden, it's not just the GOP. We're hearing alleged concerns about the debt from people like uh, Kirsten Sinema in the Senate, a Democrat. And so, uh, of course, she's getting some assistance from the media. Uh, a few weeks ago, Axios reported that she's just pouring over her spreadsheets. The spreadsheets. She's got the right. spreadsheets. She's, she has this she's got the calculator focus right uh, on, on the debt. And, you know, you've written quite a bit about uh, the debt and how these concerns are certainly inflated. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there's there's a few points here. First off, um, you know, what I like to ask people is, well, how do you know about the debt? I remember being on a panel some years back with policy types, media and policy types, and they're going on about the debt. And I go, can anyone tell me how large it is, you know, relative to the size of the economy? I mean, just roughly. And no one, no one even had a ballpark number. I mean, like within 10 percentage points of GDP. I mean, no one, no one knew. So you just go, okay, so how does your typical person on the street know about the debt? Well, they don't, except what they hear, you know, in the media, people yelling about it. But does it have a practical impact? Well, the impact is we pay interest on the debt. And that's money that's going to the people in government bonds instead of in principle going to health care or whatever we might like. Well, how large is that? Well, currently, that's about 1% of GDP. Now, by comparison, if we go back to the early mid 90s, it was over 3% of GDP. So if we're worried, oh my God, what about the burden on our kids? That's the relevant measure. Now, it can go higher. It probably will go higher. Interest rates will probably go higher. We are adding to the debt. It takes us a long time just to get back to where we were in the early 90s. And for people who might not know or remember, the 90s were a really prosperous decade in spite of that burden. But th that's really just part of the story. One of the things that gets me really angry, because uh, when I hear people meet policy people, economist type people, um, direct payments are only one way in which we pay for things. And this is a, something I've harangued a lot about. Um, patents and co patent and copyright monopolies, those are alternative ways for paying for things. And those are actually very expensive. So my favorite example, because it's probably the most important, uh, prescription drugs. We're going to spend $500 billion this year on prescription drugs. If the government hadn't given out patent and related monopolies, we'd probably spend less than $100 billion. That difference is over $400 billion a year. That comes to, to over $1,000 per person. And what's more, it's more than what we pay in service on the debt, more than what we pay in interest on the debt. So if you're being serious about, oh, the burdens on future generations, well, how about adding in patents and copyrights? Um, the other part of the story, and this is certainly important in the current context, we see that we have enormous expenditures we have to make this year because of climate related damage. I'm out in the West. So we have all these fire, fire, wildfires in Oregon and California. We had someone, some near me here in Utah. Very expensive to, to combat them. People have to be relocated. Um, that's very, very expensive. And then, of course, we had the hurricanes, the flooding in Louisiana, right up through New York and New Jersey, right across the East Coast. Um, again, that's very expensive. So if we tell our kids, I mean, just, I'm just imagining conversation, maybe I won't be alive in 30 or 40 years, but I just imagine conversation. I tell some, some young kid that, you know, they're in their early 20s going, oh, you know, we paid down the debt for you. But meanwhile, we did nothing on climate change. So they have like a whole horribly destroyed planet. You know, would I expect that kid to say thank you? I mean, it's, it's close to nuts. So the way we talk about the debt is really, um, I would just say it's, it's just, it's just fiction. It has nothing to do with reality. 
Can I just ask a quick follow up question to that? Because you mentioned the low interest rate in um, paying back the debt. And is that tied to the interest rate uh, that's, you know, decided by the Federal Reserve? Is that related at all? Oh, yeah, of course. The Federal Reserve influences interest rates and they've tried to keep them low to boost the economy through the pandemic. Um, so, you know, of course, they push down the, the 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 interest rate they most immediately control is this overnight rate. That's just what banks pay. They push that down to zero back in March, you know, when we first had the shutdown. And that certainly helped the economy and that puts downward pressure on longer rates. more So what you see is that the interest rate that the government pays on its various bonds, we usually look at the 10 year treasury is the key issue there. That's fallen a lot. I, I haven't looked today. It's somewhere around 1.3, maybe 1.4%. Historically, it's been much higher. So if you go back to the 90s, it, it was over 6% at the start of the decade. And by the end of the decade, uh, Clinton was very proud of this. You know, They had their deficit reduction. They actually were running surpluses. They got the, the 10 year treasury rate somewhere around 4%. Again, we'd have to check the exact number. But by historical standards, the interest rates that we're paying today are very, very low. Part of that is the Fed, no doubt about it. But part of that, this has been a worldwide phenomena. Part of that is that we've seen weak demand worldwide. And what that's meant is that we've had interest rates go lower because we've needed the support for the economy. So we, hasn't we have that, low rates. Hasn't that, though, also had a negative impact in regard to inflation? Um, for instance, there's now this uh, newer trend of private equity firms um, taking advantage of that cheap money uh, to buy out entire neighborhoods of residential properties and then uh, turn them into rentals. Uh, so that's uh, unfortunately leading to um, even more inflation in the housing market, um, essentially pricing people out of the housing market if they're looking to be first time home buyers. Um, and, you know, there's also the issue of uh, the increased liquidity being utilized by corporations and banks to do corporate stock buybacks. Um, is, do you see that uh, continuing to be a problem? Do you see it as a problem at all? I don't see it as a major problem. I mean, the effects of interest rates, home prices have gone up, but the flip side of that is that it's what you pay on a mortgage is much, much less. So currently the 30 year mortgage rate, again, I have to check the exact number, but somewhere close to 3%. Um, when I first got a home back in, I think it was 89, I paid 10%. Um, so, you know, you could do the arithmetic and that you could, you get, you buy a home for more than twice the price paying a 3% mortgage rate and, and have a lower monthly payment than what I had with my 10% mortgage payment back in 1989. So those are countervailing effects. And you have to look closely whether that makes it you know harder or easier. Obviously, you need a bigger down payment, which, of course, I understand is a very big problem. But a lot of people and a lot of uh, moderate income people have saved a huge amount of money on mortgages. And of course, one of the big factors that we've seen with the drop in, in interest rates is a huge number of people, literally millions, probably over 10 million at this point, refinance their mortgage. So they might have been paying four and a half percent interest back in, say, 2019, 2018. And today they're paying something close to three percent. So those are those are offsetting stories. Now, are we going to see inflation more generally? This is a big argument among economists. Uh, Larry Summers, of course, has been out there screaming. We're going to see, you know, 70s type spiraling inflation. I'm not inclined to believe that story. We are seeing uh, certain sectors, all auto in particular, have stood out that we've had uh, disruptions because of shortage of semiconductors. There was a big increase in new car prices and even bigger increase in used car prices. I don't expect that to be enduring. So we do have to keep an eye on inflation, but I'm really not expecting to see it take off. So, you know, it's a reasonable question. I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. I'm just saying um, I, I'm skeptical as to whether that's going to be an ongoing. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.